Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Eric Peterson. I am the director of the Pelican Center for Technology and Innovation. We have a great Pelicast for everyone today talking about antitrust and big tech, a hot topic that is being discussed across the country right now, especially in light of uh, COVID-19 and everyone using a lot more of these companies. Uh, but before we start and I introduce our great guests, I would uh, really like to ask you all to both like and share this video. It's really important to getting our reach out there. And I'm sure all your friends on social media will thank you for sharing such uh, entertaining and enlightening content. Uh, but without any further ado, let me introduce our two great guests. We have Alex Stapp from the Progressive Policy Institute. He is their director of policy. And we also have Neil Chilson of Stand Together and formerly at the FTC or Federal Trade Commission. Thank you so much for joining me today, guys. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for coming on. So Neil, I wanna start with you. Um, you have a lot of professional experience dealing with uh, large companies and antitrust in a previous life. So give us all a little bit of an overview of what is the history of antitrust in this country? What did it come about? And how did these cases used to be decided and how are they decided today? Uh, well, uh, thanks for that introduction. And then thanks again for having me on. Um, so the antitrust laws, the basic goal of antitrust is to maintain and preserve uh, and promote the competitive process. Uh, that These laws are more than 100 years old. Uh, the, the core laws, the Sherman Act, the Clayton Act, and the Federal Trade Commission Act, more than 100 years old. And there has been a, a lot of cases that have developed the law over time. This, the, the core statutes are very vague. Uh, the, they're very broad and they're somewhat contradictory. In, in fact, um, the Sherman Act actually prohibits any agreement in the restraint of trade, which would basically be any type of contract. And so the courts very early on discovered it was really hard to apply these in a way that made any sense in the real economy. And um, and so they started to try to figure out how to do it. And it was really hard. They, they were balancing two different things. The key challenge here is that competition um, harms competitors, right? Uh, the whole yeah. point of being a competitor is to win, uh, win new customers and you win those from somebody often. You often win them from your competitors. And so, uh, so we want to promote the types of business behaviors that uh, are good, that, that, that drive that type of competition, but we don't, want, uh, we don't want harms to competitors that are bad. And so the history of antitrust law has been figuring out what types of harms to competitors are good and what types of harms to competitors are bad. Uh, you know, for a long time, it took a long time, uh, the courts were sort of all over the place on this. Sometimes they were trying to protect small companies. That was their main goal. Sometimes they looked at economic evidence and tried to figure out like what would be best off on price and things like that. Uh, but they were kind of all over the place, and uh, you know, I think um, one of the one of the uh, one of the justices uh, said at one point that the only um, consistent theme he could see in antitrust was that the government always won. <laughs> and and so uh, fast forward to uh, the late seventies, early eighties, there started to be a lot more economic learning about you know how business practices affected custom or customers and consumers. And uh, there was a pretty, uh, a movement to kind of consolidate around this idea that when we are trying to decide what is a good practice and what is a bad practice, what is an anti-competitive practice and what is a pro-competitive practice, that ultimately we're going to look at the effect that it has on consumers at the end of the day. Um, and so the goal of antitrust is is to protect the competitive process because that competitive process produces value for customers and consumers for everyday people. And so yeah. that is the sort of touchstone of antitrust law today. Right, so uh, it's kind of popularly known as a consumer welfare standard. So uh, you would be at the FTC and... Um... If a company was acting in a way that would harm consumer welfare. Sorry, I, I missed a little bit of your question there. You froze for a second. Just uh, when you're at the FTC uh, and you would be looking at a complaint to see if someone who was violating these laws, how would the consumer welfare standard kind of play out in practice? 
So there's lots of different ways um, that the FTC would uh, assess evidence. There's tons of different evidence that the FTC might consider. Um, often it has to do around uh, prices. So the uh, there are certain types of practices that under the antitrust law are just per se anti-competitive. And that's because they almost always uh, or always drive up prices for consumers. And so one of them would be price fixing. So if I get together with my competitors and I say, hey, let's not drop prices any lower than this. You know, we're all better off as companies because I don't have to tr I don't have to worry that my competitor is going to undercut me and steal my my customers. Uh, so the companies are all better off, but consumers are way worse off because they're paying more for a product than they should. And so, uh, so price is one way that uh, the FTC looks at this. And often because that is a very salient measure uh, of competition, it's one of the best ways to uh, demonstrate that there is competition or that uh, a behavior is harming consumers is by showing that it raises prices for consumers. But there's other uh, evidence that they might look at, um, you know, they don't have to look at a ton of evidence for these types of per se ones because the economics and the the laws have, and the courts have ultimately determined that these are pretty much always bad. Um, that's the sort of, you know, collusion issues. Um, but they might look at innovation harms. Um, they might look at ways that the formation or the merger of a company might uh, preclude a future competitor. Um, uh, there's lots of different ways that they can look at this, uh, but ultimately it always goes back to, can I make an argument in front of a judge that consumers are going to be worse off under this situation than they would be um, you know, if, they, if the court uh, didn't allow this to happen? Gotcha. So we're, we're at the consumer welfare standard. There's a lot of different ways to look at it. Um, it seems like we've got some, some clarity a little bit about what's happening. But we're seeing a big rise in, in people talking about antitrust right now. And most of it is really about the tech sphere. And as you said, a lot of that, you know, the FTC would look at prices, but a lot of the products that you would see uh, being accused of these sorts of things um, don't price for their products at all. They're, they're free to use, but these claims are being brought anyway. So Alec, you've done a lot of research uh, on these kind of companies and antitrust and uh, they're kind of their benefits to the consumers or their potential harms to consumers. What is What have you found in your research? Yeah, thanks for the question. And I also am happy to be here today. I appreciate Neil yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, during, definitely laying out uh, the history of antitrust uh, in the last hundred years in less than two minutes. So I was, I was excellent. Uh, and I think as it applies to big tech today, I think the term monopoly is thrown on really loosely in public discourse. And I don't blame anyone for doing that. Not many people are antitrust experts or they're using it in a very, in a different term different sense. But as, as Neil said, these cases eventually, if, if they're brought by the government, will be in front of a judge in a courtroom and they'll have to use the technical meaning of these terms or prove that um, their charges meet technical technical understandings or definitions. And so uh, based on uh, history of our case law and the DOJ's guide guidelines on monopolization cases, uh, government would need to show that uh, a company has uh, more than a two thirds market share over an extended period of time, plus barriers to entry. And so first we need to define a market, meaning what is the market we're talking about here that the companies are competing in? And you need to show that a company has more than two thirds market share over time. And so let me get a few of the, big, the biggest names in tech. So you can look at Apple, they have 58% of the US smartphone market. So still just under that, that two thirds market share. Amazon has 38% of US e-commerce market. And again, that's excluding like physical brick and mortar retail and people can talk about how substitutable that is. Maybe it should be a broader market in that sense, Amazon would have a lower share than 38%. But if you want to look at just e-commerce, it'd be 38%. Um, if you talk about Google and Facebook, which ironically they're accused of being monopolies, but they their biggest business is digital ads and they compete directly with each other in that. And they're the two largest players in that market. And so Google has 38% of the, sorry, 30, sorry, 29% of the US digital ad market. And uh, Facebook has 23% of that market. So again, far below that threshold. Um, and then you look at prices in these markets. So what's, what's been the price of digital ads over the last decade? It's fallen by more than 40% in inflation adjusted terms. So falling prices is good for consumers. Uh, it's good for the advertisers in this sense. And then they pass on those savings to consumers because it's a cost of doing business. Uh, and then let's just quickly also discuss books. So Amazon's the original product offering, the, number, the thing that they have the highest market share. And if you look at any single product category, um, the price of books since 1997, since the year Amazon IPO became a public company, the price of books has fallen by 40% in inflation adjusted terms as well. So 
the model does not seem to be here to take a big market share, jack up prices, harm consumers. That, that's not what's going on. Uh, and so it's hard to make these cases. And then lastly, I'll just say that you often hear things like Google has 90% of the uh, search engine market. And that's, that's obviously more than two thirds have the monopolized search engines. And the key here is that I, I would argue that's not an antitrust, it's likely not an antitrust product market um, because these are multi-sided platforms. And so you have to look at how Google runs its business, right? So they get users from Google search and from many other products and services that Google offers. Uh, and then they sell ads to the, they sell ads to advertisers to show to those consumers. And so the real business or money or wherever they would exercise their market power is on the advertiser side. And so that's why I think you should really, really be looking at the digital ad market instead of the search market. Because imagine like if Google were to try to raise prices for searches for consumers, if they made it one penny per search, people would flood to Bing and then that would be the end of Google search, right? They have no pricing power on that side of the market and they're really constrained on the digital ad side. Yeah, I, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, DuckDuckGo for that matter. Uh, their their privacy on um, their searches is, is is quite great. Um, Alec, you know, you kind of you hit on some really important points in terms of market share and consumer prices. And obviously, for all of us, you know, being able to buy our books cheaper um, or buy our our digital ads if we're trying to promote something like this Pelicast uh, is great for us. Uh, but what about some of the people that they've been harming, right? If you're, if I'm writing a book now, Amazon has so much of that book market, and I can have to sell my book for less, so um, I might be hurt uh, in that way. Or you often hear about local newspapers, right? Um, the two biggest newspapers in the state have recently merged. Uh, you know, newsrooms are being devastated, and this is a problem that Google or Facebook or um, whoever has been causing. What about those kind of antitrust, you know? monopoly concerns, if you will, about these sort of companies and them exercising their market power in that way? That's a great question because it really gets to the core of what Neil was talking about, where the, the most critical question in antitrust is separating harms to consumers from harms to competitors. And so in these cases, I think you're describing a lot of very real harms to competitors in the marketplace and what you're seeing. Um, I think the evidence show, I've written a long piece on this, but the, I think the evidence shows that really it was the transition from the print world to the world of the internet that actually devastated a lot of these traditional publishers. They didn't adapt their business models. They didn't update their cost structures in terms of how they run their businesses um, to truly really compete effectively in the online world. And there's just way more competition, right? So the local newspapers you described potentially um, in Louisiana have way fewer competitors than when they're thrown onto the internet and compete globally, right? For attention and, and for advertising dollars. And so competition, I think just went way up and you never hear things talked about like Craigslist, Craigslist devastated the classified ads market, which was a huge source of revenue for uh, print newspapers. And most ads on Craigslist are free. Um, and so the, the actual real cost of classified ads went way down. Um, we don't talk about, you don't hear about them because they're not a trillion dollar company like Google. Um, and and but I think that, that gets to the point of like, that's not what actually was going on here. It was the internet. It wasn't just two companies. And um, Facebook and Google have been able to secure more ad revenue because they have a better product, right? So a hyper-targeted ad to a specific audience that an advertiser wants to reach, you can do that much more efficiently on Google or on Facebook uh, than you can with a traditional publisher. And there are really important questions like, so have we lost the public good that is the news gathering process, right? Investigative journalism is a really expensive thing. Um, yeah. and, and in a sense, the traditional newspaper bundle subsidized investigative journalism as part of like also selling classified ads and talking about the local sports team and the local town council and stuff like that. Um, so that's gone away. And so I think there are legitimate questions about should there be government subsidies, I hope in a neutral way of, of news gathering or tax cuts or some kind of transfers in place. Like how should that work is a really important question because the news is so important. But what's not going on here is that you should use the antitrust process, um, the, the, the blunt tool of antitrust to punish companies that have been really good at competing just because they don't necessarily come with the same kind of public goods that a, a previous service might have come with. Yeah, I got to say the local sports coverage down here is still top notch. So we really appreciate that for any of the uh, if you're watching out there. Um, so, Neil, you know, you might have one of these questions brought up to you at the FTC. Let's um, what one of the, the other kind of things that are brought up are uh, mergers, right? They say these companies are getting big, um, whatever it is, and they, a new competitor arises like an Instagram. And these companies are just so large, they're going to buy their competition and it doesn't matter. And so that's what's giving these companies uh, their market share. Not that they're being innovative and delivering us better products, but anytime any threat comes to them, they're, they're just putting their weight around and uh, consumers are going to be stuck with what we have. Um, how would you evaluate that when you're at the FTC and um, what do you kind of make of those claims now? 
So I, I think key to that is is looking at what's actually happening uh, or what's likely to happen post merger. And um, the way our startup culture in the U.S. works right now is that we have uh, we we have a a ton of people who are really good at creating and incubating a new idea and sort of proof of concepting it out in the real world, but aren't necessarily as good at making it like a, a, a viable long-term business. Um, and, and so acquisition can be one way that those people can be rewarded for the, the great value that they bring to the marketplace uh, by creating something new. Uh, and that, that the, uh, that big companies can help uh, develop talent and develop uh, new products. So, uh, you know, it's one thing if you look at if you looked at the marketplace and said, you know what, nothing really has changed. It's 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 obvious that these big companies have just bought people who are competing competing with them, but they haven't they haven't innovated at all. Uh, you know, uh, but you know, if, if it was like AT and T in like the 1980s, right, where people had the same black phone for 40 years. Um, the internet does not look like that. If you look at uh, if you look at Facebook, if you hadn't if if like me, you hadn't logged in for quite a while until you know I was going to share this podcast, uh, share the it. fact that we were live that we were live. Uh, the interface looks completely different than the last time I logged in, actually. And uh, and these companies are, are continuing to iterate. They're continuing to develop new things, and and that's it's not proof, but it is indicative. It's not f final proof, but it is indicative that. Uh, that they're not just resting on their laurels as monopolists, that they realize that they have to keep trying new things, doing new things, or they could quickly uh, lose market share. They could quickly lose uh, users. They could quickly lose eyeballs uh, and dollars uh, to competitors. And so, uh, so that's the way when you look at a merger, I think you try to take into account all of those things. Um, what are the benefits that are likely to come out of this merger? Um, what are the risks around, you know, is this actually foreclosing somebody who would compete uh, or is it uh, rewarding somebody who is basically not really equipped to take this and make it a full scale uh, uh, enterprise? Um, so, you know, so is there an efficiency in allowing the merger to happen? And those are some of the issues that are balanced. It's not, it's a, it's a hard, it's a hard task in part because um, it's hard to tell the future. Absolutely. But I would say that uh, I would say that the default is, you know, companies are best suited often to determine what's uh, what's in their interest, and entrepreneurs and and like and startups, they're making the choice to sell to a company for for a reason. They they have some good knowledge about like what what their best options are, and uh, and as regulators who are you know going out there and potentially saying no, you're not allowed to do this uh, because I, I don't like uh, what your plan is. Um, I think I think regulators have to be very humble about how how good they are at predicting the future compared to uh, people in these companies. Yeah, I'll yeah. add one thing there. Sorry, I, I think hindsight, I always have to mention hindsight bias here because we'll just pick one example of the Facebook cases. Um, the two most common things that are, are cited here are Instagram and WhatsApp. So the first point being, I believe over the last decade, Facebook has acquired 90 companies, right? And so we're, we're saying that two of them maybe were problematic. No one ever mentions the other 88 uh, companies. And then even in those two examples, I think it's really important to say that one, it's not clear that the WhatsApp acquisition has been super successful for Facebook. Yes, WhatsApp has more than a billion users, but Facebook hasn't successfully monetized it yet. And it's unclear whether the traditional digital ads model works for an instant messaging app, or that you know maybe those things just have to be free because there's so much competition. And people can substitute into email, SMS messaging, or what have you. So one that that acquisition cost 16 billion dollars, and they have yet to recoup their money on that. So we'll see whether that's actually potentially an anti-competitive merger. Uh, and two, on the Instagram merger, they bought it for a billion dollars. But at the time, you can go back. John Stewart had a late night monologue about how stupid this merger was, and why would anyone pay a billion dollars for a photo filtering app that just teenagers mm -hmm. use. Um, I think and, he said messes up your photos, kind of messes up your photos, right? That's, yeah, that's exactly. what he called Instagram, right? Yeah, messes <laughs> up your photos. That was like kind of the conventional wisdom at the time. And mm -hmm. and Mark Zuckerberg like made the right bet and in combination with Facebook's existing business model and assets was able to make that what is inarguably an extremely successful acquisition. And now Instagram has more than a billion users. But at the time it had, I think, sorry, it's like something like 30 million users, had no revenue. 
uh, maybe a dozen employees, something like that. And it was just extremely unclear whether Instagram would be the next, you know, billion user app or be one other thing that that Facebook did not buy. And so I think there's just tons of hindsight bias a decade later when people say, ah, oh, well, they should have blocked at the time. Like, no, it was it was it was extremely unclear that that was going to be the case. Yeah, I mean, I think we've all uh, seen that the uh, stories go around, you know, 15 years ago, should, you know, MySpace be nationalized because it's clearly got a monopoly on social media. And, uh, you know, now we, we communicate with each other in, in more ways than, you know, we ever thought possible just uh, a few years ago. But um, of course, uh, Instagram facing a lot of competition from TikTok right now, which is also in the news, but we won't get into. But uh, it, it, it hardly seems that, um, you know, the, the Zoomer generation is going to be on Instagram there move into a, a new platform as I realize I'm old and not on the cool apps anymore. <laughs> um, so, so one thing I wanted to, to kind of, um, you know, finish up on is we've talked a little bit about um, both kind of the competition that uh, they're facing from other companies and uh, consumers and some of their benefits. But what about the power that we, that these companies have? You often hear that kind of as like the third reason for antitrust, right? It's um, whatever social media company uh, is the new public square. And we need to bring antitrust or nationalize them or do something to break up their power because they just control the discourse. And that's just too important, uh, especially as we're going into an election. Um, you know, we, ha we have to do something. And antitrust is the best tool that we have to do that. Uh, let me start with you, Neil. Kind of what, what do you make of that case? So uh, my colleague Casey Maddox and I wrote a paper on this uh, asking whether or not antitrust is the right tool to solve free speech issues and concluding, no, it isn't. And uh, the primary reason antitrust is not a good tool for this, well, let me just say people really disagree on the problem, right? So, so when you hear uh, people complain that these companies have too much power, uh, what you'll hear is people on the right essentially saying they're taking down too much uh, you know, conservative speech. And people yeah. on the left who are like, these companies are too powerful. They're leaving up, essentially, they're leaving up too much conservative speech is what they argue. And so uh, and so, uh, I think when we think about what solutions to that problem, <laughs> those two different problems, we got to really think about how would people that I really disagree with use that solution in the future um, to control speech on these platforms. And, and we have really good evidence that antitrust in the past prior to this consumer welfare uh, being the, the main touchstone uh, was, was abused uh, specifically um, to infringe on freedom of speech. Uh, President Johnson literally blocked a bank merger because he knew that the, the president of that bank was also the owner of the Houston Chronicle, which was highly critical of him. And he basically made a deal with that guy and said, I'll let your merger through as long as your paper is nice to me for the next, you know, for the rest of my term. And lo and behold, uh, the paper started printing nice things about him and then uh, the merger went through. And so uh, this is indicative of a, a law that is where the standards are so arbitrary that courts can't really determine, uh, you know, whether or not the government is, is being, uh, is being abusive in its use of the antitrust authority or if it's actually bringing a real case. And so so if we went back to an antitrust law that could allow such uh, flimsy cases to be brought, I think we would see actually a chilling of speech and a real risk um, to freedom of expression online. Uh, and fundamentally, these aren't really competition issues. These are disagreement issues. This is, this is sort of like the way I talk about it in the paper is, um, uh, it's not a competition issue that some people like uh, Pepsi and some people like Coke. Uh, you can't mm -hmm. you can't compete that out, right? Like the mm -hmm. fact is, people have different preferences, and so these companies are delivering different things, and and that's and and we couldn't, you know, some of these antitrust arguments are essentially like we should make I'm a Pepsi drinker, and therefore everybody should have to drink Pepsi, and that's not a market solution. It's not something that antitrust is well suited to do. Uh, and from my viewpoint, it's it's it, you know it's not a very liberty loving uh, approach to uh, to regulation either. So, Alec, what say you? Should we nationalize Twitter? Uh, I I would be against nationalizing Twitter. Uh, I just think it's always it's always ironic that all these complaints often happen on social media, right? So people, so conservatives saying I'm being censored as they tweet that or post that on Facebook or start a live stream or do something. So I think uh, in any of these debates, whether it's about speech or you know uh, market power the ability to exclude people from the marketplace. 
I always try to compare it also to like what life was like just even the 1990s before like the internet really took off in terms of commercialization or the ability to uh, share political speech online. And it's just night and day, right? Like the ability for us to even have this this event right now, for, no, I think no one paid Facebook to, to host this event and uh, it's free for us. We can have as many users, that, any as many viewers as want to hear what we're saying can tune into this. We're not being silenced or censored or anything. Yeah, make sure to share this video, everyone who's watching. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, good promotion. So you gotta promote yourself. But I think this is often, often people you hear complaining, uh, especially politicians saying like, why is my, why are my campaign emails getting sent to the spam folder? Or why are my tweets not getting thousands of likes? And it's like, because people don't wanna hear your message. And like, you're actually not that persuasive or you're not that engaging, right? And you're losing competition in like the, the, the marketplace for ideas, right? Or the war of ideas, like you're losing. Um, that doesn't feel good. But I think if anything, we have more speech than ever, more access to different platforms for speech. And while Facebook is the biggest, there are other options if you don't like Facebook where you can get your opinion out there. So I think if anything, we have we have too many opinions, not too few. On the <laughs> yeah, too many bad antitrust opinions perhaps going around on, uh, on social media. But hopefully they're watching this, learning something, and uh, and and you know we we've educated them. So I guess what I'm hearing is uh, you know this is kind of a content moderation issue, which is a topic for another telecast, but. Um, you know, people generally have access to more speech and, and we feel that's a, a good thing, but competition obviously to, to reach people is, is kind of the, the end all be all solution to this, at least in the short term. Would you agree with that, Neil? Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I think as long as the companies have a strong incentive to, uh, have platforms that have lots of people and lots of users and lots of conversation on them, uh, which I think they do, uh, now. Um, I, I think the antitrust laws are not a good way to, to solve this. The, the, the market is competitive. Uh, there are incentives on these companies to behave in ways that maximize the, the, you know, the ability of people to get their ideas out there. Um, and even if, even if there were some issues with it, I don't think uh, antitrust law, which is a, a big hammer, uh, you know, it's the atom bomb of, uh, of regulatory approaches, uh, I don't think it's the right approach here. Yeah. And I'll just add, I'll just have one thing there. I think in terms of mm -hmm. framing this debate, to be most generous to the other side, or to say like, and what, under what scenarios would I be open to much more um, strict intervention or using the antitrust hammer? Like, when is it merited? And I think in certain markets, when you kind of reach the end of history, when you think there's actually no potential for new platforms for dynamic innovation to happen, then you really are kind of in a scenario where you're trying to just divide the spoils, divide the gains equitably, make sure people have access to this resource. So think of something like um, utilities, like, like, and particularly like, like water pipes to your house, right? Like, are we innovating in like water being delivered to your house? Mm -hmm. No, like the water is the same as it was decades ago. Does it make sense to have multiple sets of pipes uh, going through every neighborhood? Like that seems redundant, it seems inefficient. So there's like a natural monopoly here. So yeah, it probably kind of makes sense to like have the government or some entity regulate the price so that you're not being gouged for the price of the water to your home. Because I think we've reached the end of history for this one very narrow commodity. And again, this is like the exception, not the rule. This is a very particular market that maybe that makes sense for. What it doesn't make sense for, I think, are things like tech platforms that Neil was talking about that are still innovating, still changing, still competing. So if you, th so this is where I would say that the, the, the main divide is, do you think the smartphone is the end of history? And there's no future tech platform. We went from mainframe computers to PCs to smartphones and it's over then yeah, maybe we do need much stricter rules on Android and iOS because they do have a currently have a duopoly in that market. And I don't see it changing for smartphones. I see the change being, I think there will be a new future platform that's 10X the size of smartphones. But if you think that's not the case, then I would I understand why you want more regulation in that sense. And so, and the question in many of these markets is, have we reached the end of history? And I would argue no, but some people think, I guess that we do have. So uh, I want to end on a, a great user question. We've got some great user questions and uh, we, we really thank everyone for doing so. Um, I'm going to ask it to Alec is uh, Facebook has kind of made news recently. Um, the, the EU has been really kind of cranking, uh, cranking up the regulation of not just Facebook, but a lot of other companies, Apple, um, they passed something called uh, GDPR, which is a, a data privacy regulation and, and Facebook has kind of been threatening to pull out. So they've taken a different model from America, which is kind of a, um, you know, a light touch approach, uh, focus on consumers. What does that European model look like, Alec? And, and how effective do you think it's been at, um, I would say just delivering the stuff that we all want, right? We want innovation, we want lower prices. Um, have their regulations kind of met their goals? Yeah, so I think I love that 
GDPR is being brought into an antitrust discussion because I think there's the things that have to be discussed together. And so with many things in Europe, GDPR being one of them, kind of the stated goal was like the idea of like reining in the tech companies or punishing them in some, in some way for abusing consumers or abusing kind of fundamental rights that Europeans have. And so if you think about that, that, that as their goal they had going into it was to hurt the big American tech companies. The sad irony is that actually GDPR has been best for the Googles and Facebooks of the world. And that's because at a very high level, GDPR is about an opt-in consent model. And so it's saying that you can't do almost anything with consumer data, with European users' data, unless they give you explicit um, affirmative consent to do so. And so what that does in the entire digital ad market is says, okay, if you have a first party walled garden platform, like you know Google's platforms, like Facebook's platforms, where you have a one-to-one -one relationship with the end user, they trust you to some extent. So if you give them a pop-up saying, do you consent, do you opt in? They're all going to click yes because they want to keep using the services. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to they're going to get that consent, so they're going to comply with GDPR. It's not a problem for them. It's a problem for the small publishers, small ad exchanges, small third party websites, um, small ad tech ad tech vendors. And there's data on this; it's already happening. Cause it's been in, in effect for more than two years that those companies are withering. The market share is moving towards Google and Facebook. And so, if anything, GDPR has strengthened their positions because of this again because of the opt in consent model of that. And so, it's really backfired in that sense. And in terms of effects on consumers. Um, I think that there are some benefits to privacy that maybe aren't captured in the current market. I think there's a smarter way to do privacy regulation that my organization supports at the federal level here in the United States. But the, the model in, in Europe and the model in California, you see at the state level, is really the opposite of that because the way consumers interact with it now is you now have to click, I accept cookies on every single website you ever visit, even if you've already done it a hundred times for the rest of your life. And I don't know anyone who thinks that makes them feel safer or more like their privacy is being protected. It's just annoying. Um, and so I don't think there's actually been real tangible privacy benefits for the costs that consumers incur and, and definitely for the costs to competition in the marketplace. Neil, do you have anything to add? Uh, I would just, you know, the unintended consequences of regulation, well, well intended regulation. I think GDPR is an excellent example of that. Uh, almost a, directly backfiring in Europe is not letting go on that. They're sort of doubling down and they're trying to like adjust by creating other initiatives that will try to spur innovation in Europe, um, you know, because they've chilled so much innovation through uh, some of these well-intended, but uh, not hard, you know, hard to, hard to anticipate the effects um, legislation. So, uh, so I think I think regulators have to think about the unintended consequences, even when they they are trying to do something that sounds good and that even is intended to be good. Yeah, I think uh, correct me if I'm wrong. That Europe has one top thirty tech company. And I'd say it says something like half of all the top thirty. So yeah, and that's and that's and that's kind of why I've always think this conversation is kind of ironic because in the international global debate it's often framed as Europe is the leader on tech regulation. And so therefore the U.S. needs to catch up to Europe and therefore lead other countries because Japan, um, other countries, other countries in Asia, South America, they're looking to mimic GDPR or, or find their own way. And so we have to give them a model to go towards before they end up following Europe instead. And I always wonder like, how did the conversation get framed this way when we are the ones who have the largest most successful tech companies, we're the ones who create the global public goods for internet users everywhere. Um, we have a dynamic, vibrant tech sector, and in Europe, they're kind of a laggard and they're in a static environment. And so why is that the model we should be implementing? Why aren't people asking, what about the United States model should the Europeans be um, emulating? But no one ever says that, just me and Neil. <laughs> I said it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, I think if, uh, I've not done public polling on this, but I imagine if I polled a tech company's popularity versus uh, regulation or clicking the I accept cookies, uh, the tech companies would probably uh, you know, come out ahead for most consumers. So uh, thank you both for a great discussion. Um, I, you know, I hope everyone learned a lot. Please, again, share this on social media. Um, you know, Hit the like, hit the share button. It means so much. Um, we'll be back in a few other weeks to talk about content moderation and a lot of other fun stuff. But Neil and Ak, it was great to have you. You taught me so much today, and I hope everyone learned a lot too. Great. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Bye.